Thank you, Frédéric, for the uh, introduction. So thank you all for being here uh, for this second lecture. So as announced yesterday, today I will be talking about um, filtering methods. for uh, some singular penalization problems. So these methods were uh, introduced in the context of hyperbolic partial differential equations by Chauchet in a paper of 94. And then they were also uh, developed, uh, so maybe independently or in a sequential way, by Grenier. Uh, to, so in a, the context of, uh, let's say, fluid dynamics, uh, some years later, and the paper appeared uh, some years later, and then they were used in a whole variety of contexts by uh, many different authors. Uh, so let me quote uh, you know, Chemin, Gallagher, Desjardins, Saint-Raymond, Gérard Varet, so on. So, and to, so the goal today is to, so first to explain the general idea behind the theory, and uh, to uh, let's say apply that to at least one example, which will be uh, the derivation of the oberbeck boussinesque system. And if I have time in the end, I will also uh, present to you a second application in the context of uh, rotating fluids. Okay. So I will start with the general strategy. Okay. So in the, um, all the situations I will be working with in, the, in, the, in these lectures, you have the following type of problem. So you have a PDE, which I will write in the following way. So you have dt u epsilon plus one over L u epsilon plus some quadratic operator, u epsilon, u epsilon, okay, minus some diffusion operator, epsilon equals zero. So here, epsilon is a small parameter. L is an anti-symmetric operator. Okay, so for instance, think of the rotation operator. Okay, it's a, uh, well, because it's a rotation, it's uh, anti-symmetric in L2 and even in HS. Um, and, in all of the, the applications I will present. So this will maybe not be so important today, but it will be uh, more important tomorrow when we look at uh, boundary problems. Uh, this anti-symmetric operator will be uh, of order less than one. Okay, so Q is a quadratic operator. also of order less than one, and D is the diffusion. And this one is of order two. Okay. Uh, so formally, if u epsilon converges towards some function u bar, as epsilon goes to zero, what you expect is that L u bar is equal to zero. So you were solving an, uh, an evolutional equation of order two, diffusion type, and u bar only here solves uh, some kind of constraint equation, which is now of order one, okay? And this will generate some difficulties in, uh, as soon as you have boundaries, for instance. Okay. The discrepancy between the orders of the operator for u bar and u epsilon. Okay. But today, what I want to focus on is the fact that the, the presence of this uh, anti-symmetric operator with a penalization will create waves in the system. And the question is, how do you handle these fast propagating waves? Okay. 
So if you remember yesterday's story model, a uh, natural idea was to filter the oscillations generated by uh, the wave operator. So the idea is to introduce the wave operator or the wave equation. So you look at the solution of dTU plus LU equals zero with uh, U at time tau equals zero equals U zero, okay? So this is a wave equation, okay? And you denote that S of tau, which is exponential uh, minus tau L, be the associated semi group. Or in fact, in that case, it's a group, okay? So in other words, you have U at times tau, which is S of tau U naught. And then, so let's assume that this wave operator is well defined, okay? And now you go back to the original problem. And you define V epsilon of t, which is exponential of t over epsilon l times u epsilon of t. So in other words, you write that u epsilon of t is s of t over epsilon v epsilon of t, okay? This step is called filtering the oscillations. Okay, V epsilon is your filtered function, your filtered unknown, okay? Uh, it's really, uh, from the ODE point of view, it's really a variation of the constant, okay? Except that here you have operators, so it's slightly more complicated, but th this is really what it is. Um, so if you filter out the oscillations, what you end up with, so everything is more or less formal at this point, but I will make this, uh, rigorous in some examples in a moment. So you have dt of v epsilon, <coughs> the one over epsilon, lu epsilon disappears because you did everything to make it disappear, okay? You filtered out everything. And so you have a q epsilon of v epsilon v epsilon minus d epsilon of v epsilon equals zero. And here in this equation, So Q epsilon of V, V is exponential of T over epsilon L, Q of exponential minus T over epsilon L, V, exponential minus T over epsilon L, V. Okay, this is your new quadratic operator. Uh, and D epsilon, of V is exponential T over epsilon L times the diffusion operator applied to exponential minus T over epsilon L V, okay? So you have a more complicated equation, okay? But you no longer have uh, a singular uh, operator here, okay? So now let's assume that in the beginning, u epsilon was bounded, okay? So you, the, the general situation is that u epsilon is bounded in say, so, 
think of, for instance, the Navier-Stokes equation. So let's say it's bounded in L infinity in time, L2 in space. And I'm not specifying what the spatial domain is. Okay? If this is true, and if L is anti-symmetric, so it preserves the L2 norm, then it means that V epsilon will inherit from all the bounds of U epsilon. So V epsilon is also bounded. Okay, so because, so since L is anti-symmetric, V epsilon inherits from all, let's say, uh, Sobolev norms. on U epsilon, okay? So now look at this equation here. So you know now that V epsilon is also bounded uniformly in epsilon. So this means that, for instance, again, think of Q as U grad U, for instance, it means that this quantity is bounded in a negative Sobolev space, okay? And this quantity is also bounded in a negative Sobolev space. Yeah, I'm not specifying the functional spaces here, but this is the uh, general idea, okay? So if you go into a negative enough Sobolev space, everything will be bounded here. So this means that the time derivative of the epsilon now is bounded as well. And therefore, you inherit some compactness on the sequence V epsilon, which you didn't have, obviously, in the beginning on the sequence U epsilon because it's not compact, it has oscillations. Okay, but now that you have removed these oscillations, your new sequence V epsilon, you can expect it to be bounded. Okay. So, you have some observations. The first observation is, so it's exactly what I said. Now, uh, dt v epsilon is bounded in a negative Sobolev space. So if you don't know what negative Sobolev spaces are, don't worry, okay, let's assume that uh, u epsilon was in fact bounded not in L2, but in Hs, with S very large, let's say H2. Okay, so H2 is the uh, same thing as H1, but with two derivatives. Now, okay, so it's, uh, you have a function that is in L2, and such that the derivatives, of, the derivatives in uh, space in the distributional sense are also in L2, okay? And so if your initial function u epsilon is, in, uh, H, is bounded in L infinity H2, then all your uh, right-hand side here, q epsilon of v epsilon, v epsilon, minus d epsilon of v epsilon, this is bounded now in L2, okay? So in that case, dt v epsilon is bounded in uh, L2. And this gives you some compactness on the sequence v epsilon, okay? This is essentially Ascoli's theorem. It's exactly uh, the same thing when you construct Loret solutions for the Navier-Stokes equation, you have a step that looks exactly like that. Okay, you construct your Galyarkin approximation and at some point you need to prove that you have some compactness on your uh, approximating sequence and you, you, you prove that the time derivative is bound. Okay, so, um, yeah, so your sequence is compact and you can try to pass to the weak limit in the uh, equation up there. And this is what I'm going to do now. Okay, so, to go further, I need to make some additional assumptions. So now, uh, assume that there exists a Hilbertian basis of L2. So say uh, that the Hilbertian basis is NK with k in z, um, such that 
you have L and K equals I lambda K and K with uh, lambda K real valued, okay? It needs to be real valued because L is anti-symmetric, okay? So assume that you can diagonalize your operator L. This will be the case in uh, other situations we will be considering. Um, in that case, you can uh, write, you can decompose V epsilon onto that basis. So you can write V epsilon of T as the sum over K of uh, B epsilon K of T times NK. Okay, and since I know that the sequence V epsilon is compact, it means that my B epsilon K are also compact. They converge towards some BK as, uh, as epsilon goes to zero. So we have B epsilon K converges towards BK as epsilon goes to zero. Okay, and now let me rewrite everything uh, or the quadratic operator over there. Okay, so now Q, uh, well, I will start with exponential minus T over epsilon L times V epsilon. This is exactly the sum over K. Quick question. Yes. Yes, I'm doing everything up to a subsequence. Minus T over epsilon I lambda K, BK uh, epsilon of T, and K. Okay? This is just the definition of the wave operator. And therefore, if I compute Q epsilon of V epsilon, V epsilon, so this is exponential of T over epsilon L times the sum, for applied to the sum over K and L of exponential minus IT over epsilon lambda K plus lambda L times B epsilon K B epsilon L and I have Q of NK and L. Okay, so bilinear expansion. Now this quantity Q of NK and L, you can decompose it again along the basis NM, say, well NK, but I need a third index, so it will be NM. So this will be the sum over all K, L and M of exponential I T over epsilon lambda M minus lambda K minus lambda L B epsilon K B epsilon L. Uh, so you take the scalar product of N M with Q of N K and L and M. Okay, I decompose this onto the basis. It gives me this uh, quantity here. This is the L2 scalar product. And then I apply my wave operator, which gives me this uh, additional lambda M. Okay, so remember the goal was to pass to the weak limit in this quantity here. Okay? Let's forget for a moment that you have an infinite sum. I will come back to that later on, okay? Um, you know that this, and so you, I forget that I have an infinite sum, and so I just want to pass to the limit in each term. I know that this converges to BK, and I know that this converges to BL, okay? This does not depend on epsilon, so I only need, and this, this convergence here is strong. Okay, so I only need to pass to the weak limit in this term here. Okay, and now you have uh, the Riemann-Lebesgue lemma, okay, or the non-stationary phase theorem, if you want to have a more a fancier name. Uh, you know that this exponential weakly converges towards zero unless uh, 
uh, you have lambda m equals lambda k plus lambda l. Okay. So, uh, Riemann, Lebeg, Lemma ensures that if lambda m minus lambda k minus lambda l is non zero, then the exponential of it over epsilon times this quantity weakly converges towards zero. Okay, you have oscillations, they cancel out. Okay. So if you take the weak limit of this term, the only terms that will matter in the limit, as epsilon goes to zero, are the resonant terms. So this is different from zero, maybe. Okay. Therefore, the only terms that matter in the weak limit are the ones such that lambda a m minus lambda k minus lambda l equals zero. And this is called the resonance set. Or, and maybe I will add something else, which is uh, more or less trivial, but it's... Uh... And also, obviously, for the term to matter in the limit, you also need to have this scalar product, which is non-zero. Okay. And typically, if you're working in Fourier, this will give you a condition on the frequencies. Okay, let's say... Uh, well, let's say that you are in dimension one, and let's say that actually nk is a kind of Fourier basis, so you are oscillating at frequency k. If you need this to be non-zero, then essentially you need to have m equals k plus l, something like that. So I will often have some uh, such a such a condition. Okay, and q of uh, so scalar product of n m with Q of n, k, and l, non-zero, okay? And this is called the resonance set. So, of course, everything I'm doing here is a, a bit formal, uh, because I don't go into any, any detail. For instance, I told you that uh, here, I'm, uh, at this stage, I just want to pass to the limit in each single term. Obviously, you know that uh, this might not be completely sufficient because it's possible that lambda m minus lambda k minus lambda l is uh, non-zero, but very small, okay? And so, in the in what you might uh, what you might get in the limit is a kind of small divisor assumption. Okay, so I won't be talking about this much because it's really a, <coughs> a case by case analysis. Okay, you in each single case you need to look at what you, the frequencies of your wave operator look like, and to check whether or not this quantity might become small, let's say for large frequencies, and whether or not you will need to handle some kind of small divisor. But I uh, just wanted to um, give you some warning that there might be some difficulty here, okay, and a non-trivial one. So in some problems, one way to get around this difficulty is just to truncate your sequence in the beginning, okay, so for instance, you just uh, work with a finite number of BKs because you, you truncate at a given frequency, your, your limit system, okay? And in that case, if you only have a finite number of, uh, of, uh, of terms in, the, in, that, um, in that expansion, then essentially you're fine 
because uh, you will not have to deal with these uh, small divisors for large frequencies. But it really depends on the problem you are studying and one should be careful. Okay, there might be a difficulty here. Um, okay, so this is what I wanted to say for the quadratic term, essentially. And then the last difficulty is the diffusion term. And here the situation is very different depending uh, on whether you have boundaries or not. So in today's lecture, I will work in cases without boundaries. So if there are no boundaries, and in uh, a lot of cases, the, everything essentially uh, is diagonal in Fourier space. So if uh, the diffusion operator applied to V is like operator of D of Xi uh, applied to V, okay? So operator of D applied to V, so it's the inverse Fourier transform of D of Xi V hat of Xi, okay? And if uh, uh, nk is a Fourier basis, essentially. Then everything works well, because as you can see, if you have no boundaries, everything commutes. So you, where is it? In the definition of the operator, uh, d epsilon on the top board over there, you can commute the exponential, uh, you can commute L with D, okay? So you can commute the exponential with D, and then D epsilon is just D. Then in that case, you have uh, LD equals DL, and D epsilon equals D. So in that case, there is no actual difficulty. If there are boundaries, then these two operators in general do not commute, okay? And you, then there is no general strategy to deal with that, okay? Uh, L and D is different from DL in general. And typically, what you might end up with is a, is a boundary layer, okay? But uh, in other words, this, another way to see that in a, let's say, a more uh, linear algebra um, way is to say that the operator one over epsilon L plus D is not a normal operator. So a normal operator is exactly an operator which has an anti-symmetric part and a self-adjoint part, okay? And in which the two parts, the anti-symmetric one and the self-adjoint one, commute. And in that case, you can do essentially the same theory as for self-adjoint operators, which means that you can find a basis of uh, eigenvectors, okay? But if the operator is not normal, then this, uh, <laughs> this falls down, and, uh, and you have no general theory, okay? So I will present an example, uh, I hope tomorrow. Uh, this is typically what happens for Ekman layers when you, when you have uh, rotating fluid equations between two, two planes. And, uh, and in that case, the interaction between uh, the Coriolis operator and the diffusion operator creates an additional source term in the limit equation. Okay, so it has a non-trivial effect. Okay, so this is uh, what I wanted to explain for the 
general theory. Let me just check that I didn't forget anything. And if not, um, no, that's it. And if not, I will go to the first application, which is the, as promised yesterday, the derivation of the Oberbeck Businesk model. Quick question. Yes. Um, could, the, could you handle by the same technique the case where L, cap, the, the L operator depends on the slow time? Ha, uh, I guess so, yes. Uh, I wouldn't be, uh, I guess so. So you just have a more complicated, uh, your wave operator will depend on the slow time, okay? But, yeah, we need to write everything, but why not? Okay, so the first application, and maybe the only one actually, but so I will say uh, number one. So uh, yes, by the way, I have uh, handwritten notes and I will uh, put them on my web page uh, as soon as I think about it. Uh, so you, you really have, uh, in any case, a second application in the notes, even if I don't have time to do it today. Uh, derivation of the overbeck businesk model. So I apologize because I will need to look at my notes to write down the system, because it's, uh, it's not something that I did myself. This, uh, everything that I will be talking about in this paragraph is from a paper by Feyreisel and Novotny. Um, in uh, GMFM 2009, okay. Uh, and as you will see, it's a bit, uh, well, there are a lot of notations involved, and I'm pretty sure that if I don't look at my notes, then <laughs> I will make some mistakes. So uh, the, the system you're working with in the beginning is the Navier-Stokes Fourier system. So they do not treat rotation, and so I have also dropped the rotation term in the, in the, present, uh, in the present model. I'm pretty sure that you can add a rotation term of order one and it doesn't change anything, okay? If you want to penalize by the rotation as well, then it's another story because if the rotation enters into your penalization operator, you have to do everything again, okay? So, but if you take a, a, a rotation term of order one, this is completely transparent in the, all the analysis. Uh, so the initial system is the following, so you have Conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, you have a Mach number that is of order epsilon, and a uh, Froude number that is a further square root of epsilon. And this is the equation for the conservation of energy or entropy, uh, which is in a slightly different form from what I wrote yesterday. Okay, and in fact here you just have a, an inequality. So now let me, uh, so in that case, like I said, the Mach number is of order epsilon, and the foot number is of order square root of epsilon. Okay, and now let me define everything. So, uh, the pressure is given by the following formula. So it's epsilon over four, what does uh, the right-hand side in the last equation mean? Sigma epsilon? Sigma epsilon. Sigma epsilon, yes. It's a, no, it's the, um, it's the viscous tensor. Okay. Uh, so P epsilon of theta is epsilon over four theta to the four. 
plus theta to the 5 half, capital P of rho over theta to the 3 half. The viscous stress tensor is 2 times mu theta epsilon, the symmetric part of the gradient, minus 2 thirds divergence of u epsilon times identity, plus zeta of theta epsilon, divergence of u epsilon times identity. S epsilon is 4 epsilon over 3, theta epsilon theta to the power 3 over rho. I'm dropping the epsilons in the formulas here, plus some function f s of rho over theta to the 3 half, with s prime equals minus 3 half of 5 thirds of p minus z p prime of z over d square. And at last, the viscous stress tensor is 1 over theta epsilon, epsilon square. Well, no, uh, yeah. Um, plus some kappa of theta epsilon, gradient of theta epsilon square over theta epsilon. Okay, this is it. Okay, so uh, okay, so this has a complicated form, but uh, actually, you need to have a specific form like that to be sure that solutions exist and weak solutions exist globally. Okay, the, so we will indeed use the specific form of each quantity in the the derivation, but uh, yeah, th there is a, it's also quite involved because you need to have a, a well posedness theory in the beginning, okay? So there are some assumptions. I will not write everything down uh, in order not to burden the talk too much. So uh, mu and zeta are uh, positive functions that are smooth. They have uh, sublinear growth at infinity. I think uh, kappa is also a, a smooth function, positive as well, that has subcubic growth at infinity. And you have some uh, growth assumptions as well on the uh, other quantities. Okay. So maybe what I will start with is a, um, uh, a formal derivation of the oberbeck businesque model, okay, just to give you a flavor of what the formal analysis looks like. And then I will um, go into the rigorous derivation of this model, okay? Um, the, the P epsilon on the first Yeah, equation, it depends on the epsilon. First equation, uh, board. That's the pressure? Yes. And it depends on theta and rho, doesn't yes. it? Yes. It does. So why do you say V of theta? Ah, theta and rho. And the P function, where do we have that? It's a given function that has some specific growth at infinity that I cannot tell you by heart. And it's the same function P that is here. So there is a link between the entropy and the pressure. It's probably monotonic. Yes, it's, yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, so the formal, I will start with the formal derivation. Okay, so this will be uh, in the spirit of what we did yesterday. So you assume that you have a solution uh, 
that uh, behaves uh, like uh, rho epsilon equals one plus some epsilon rho, uh, uh, right, rho one plus uh, something of order epsilon two. Same thing for theta epsilon. Okay, and you try to understand what the limit of everything is, okay? And uh, so obviously you need to assume that your initial data satisfies such assumptions, okay? But this is exactly what I will be doing more rigorously afterwards. So you start from initial data that are small variations close to uh, one one, okay? Uh, so the first thing to do is to have an asymptotic expansion for all these quantities here. Uh, and I will try not to make too much a mess of it. So I will start with P epsilon. P epsilon, uh, so the main order term is just P of one. But this one is a constant, so it really doesn't matter in the, in the gradient, right? You can remove it if you want. Uh, plus, then you have a term of order epsilon, which is, uh, so, one-fourth for the theta four. And then you have five half of theta one. Is it five? Is it five half? Yes, five half of theta one P of one plus a quantity that will be important in the following and that I will denote by theta right away, uh, times P prime of one, and theta is row one minus three half of theta one. Okay, as you can see, it will come into play here and here, and so I uh, introduce it right now, okay? And then you have some uh, epsilon 2p2 that you don't compute and so on, okay? Uh, next, for the, ah, yes. Uh, maybe something that I should say right away is that when you pass to the limit in the, uh, in the first equation, the equation on the conservation of mass, if rho epsilon converges to one in the limit, you will converge to some divergence free function. Okay, so if you have this, you have, and uh, you have u epsilon that converges to u with divergence of u equals zero, okay? So in that case, the divergence of u epsilon term here will, uh, will disappear, okay? So I think that in tau epsilon, I only need the main order term. So tau epsilon is just uh, two mu of one, times d of u plus something of order epsilon that I don't compute. Then I have the s epsilon. So the main order term in S epsilon is just S of one. And then for the epsilon order term, you have four thirds plus uh, S prime of one times theta. Okay. Uh, plus something of order epsilon two. Didn't forget anything, no, that's it. And for uh, and sigma epsilon is just of order epsilon two. Okay, 
So now I can try and formally pass to the limit in these uh, equations. Okay, so I do an asymptotic expansion. So like I already said, the first equation just gives you the fact that it gives you the Businesque approximation. So it says that U is divergence free. Okay, so this here is Businesque. Then, when you look at the second equation, so the term of order one over epsilon two disappears because it's just the gradient of a constant, which is zero, and then you need to look at the terms of order one over epsilon. So if you look at the terms of order one over epsilon, you're going to balance the gradient of the order epsilon term in the pressure with uh, one over epsilon row one in the right hand side. So let's do that. What you have is the gradient of one fourth, which disappears, times five fifth of theta one P one <coughs> plus theta P prime of one equals minus uh, E3. Okay? So you integrate that and you obtain that this quantity is minus Z plus some constant. Okay, and then, so this is uh, the order epsilon to the minus one. And when you look at the order epsilon to the power zero, what you obtain is dt u plus, plus u grad u, since u is divergence free, uh, plus the gradient of P2, uh, equals, so you have the Laplacian coming up, minus mu Laplacian u, okay? Um, and what you have is uh, minus rho one E3 in the right hand side. Okay. Okay. So this is uh, okay. It looks uh, already like uh, the, the the equation I wanted for uh, for you, right? So now I need to derive the equation for O one. Maybe I will. Uh, So in the equation for row one, you look at the, uh, the last equation, the one on the entropy, and in fact, so okay, let's assume that here I have uh, equal to zero, okay? Uh, I have equality. I, I will prove that uh, in fact in the, in the limit, the, I almost have an equality, okay? Uh, or I will prove or I will state. Uh, so what you obtain when you look at the main order term is the following. So dt s epsilon, oh yes, you need to look at the uh, epsilon order term. So, on the term in the last equation. And what you have is the following. 
So uh, you need to look first at, so if you take rho epsilon, which is one, and then you take the epsilon order term for S epsilon, so you have four thirds plus S prime of one times theta. And then you have S of one times rho one, okay? Plus here, uh, essentially the same thing multiplied by u. And you also have a term which is S of one times uh, u one, where I'm assuming that u behaves like u plus epsilon u1. u epsilon behaves like u plus epsilon u1. Plus. Okay. And then here what you have is minus uh, divergence of kappa, and I think this is already, the main order term is already uh, for other epsilon because you have a gradient. Okay, so you, the main order term is just uh, kappa bar, say the, the, so kappa of one times the gradient of theta one equals zero. Okay, and you need to combine this also with uh, the, the, uh, the conservation of mass at order uh, at order epsilon, and when you combine the two, so that in, when you do that, you get rid of, uh, of certain terms, you get rid of this, this, and this, okay? And what you end up with is the following. You end up with dt theta plus u gradient of theta minus kappa Laplacian, kappa bar Laplacian of theta one equals zero. I wrote, yeah, I wrote the capital theta in my notes, but uh, yeah. And then you use this equation here. Okay, and the definition of theta which is over there, so you combine the two, and you end up, so, uh, so you, there's a small computation here, but which is trivial and which I'm not doing, and what you end up is that dt rho one plus u grad rho one minus alpha u three minus kappa Laplacian rho one equals zero for some positive alpha. So let me just quickly explain where this comes from. So you need to replace this theta by row one. When you do that, you have some uh, minus z coming up, okay? And when you compute u grad z, this gives you exactly the u3, okay? So you do, uh, it's it really, uh, it's an easy computation, okay? You just combine this, the definition of theta and this, uh, and this conservation here, that's it, okay? So this is for the formal derivation. Are there questions? No? Well, if not, I will now uh, try to explain how this formal derivation can be made uh, rigorous by uh, using Chauchet's method of filtering oscillations. Row one. Yeah, exactly. So the equations, let me maybe, um, so you have divergence u equals zero. You have this equation here. And the last one is this one. Okay, 
So it's a closed system of equations. And, uh, Okay, so uh, uh, let's see. I, since I have uh, half of an hour left, I, uh, maybe I won't go too much into the details of the notion of solution, okay? Uh, I will just mention this uh, rather briefly. So now the rigorous derivation. So there is a, there's a definition, but which in fact I won't give because I think it, it might use up a whole blackboard. Uh, there is a notion of variational solution for NSF epsilon. Uh, and may maybe what I can just do is uh, comment it briefly, okay? Uh, the notion of the of variational solution is the following. So you, for the first equation, the equation on the conservation of mass, what you assume is that you have a renormalized solution, okay? So, uh, yeah, you know, the solutions defined by, uh, by uh, Lyons and so on to, uh, for transport equations. Uh, the second equation, you assume that it's satisfied in the sense of distributions, okay? You assume some, obviously, some uh, integrability on the different quantities so that uh, every term makes sense and, uh, and that you have some, uh, some, a little bit of compactness. Um, you also assume that this uh, inequality is satisfied in the distributional sense, okay? And the last thing that you assume is that you have conservation of energy. And maybe this is the only thing that I will write down. Um, so essentially you need everything to be satisfied in the sense of distributions. A little more for the first equation because you assume that you have a renormalized solution and some integrability and you have conservation Exactly. Exa uh, every uh, okay. If you look at, you multiply the equation by beta prime of rho epsilon, where beta is a smooth and sublinear uh, function, and then uh, beta of rho epsilon satisfies the equation you expect in the sense of distributions. Uh, so you have conservation of energy. And so let me write down the energy. The energy is like this, okay. So, and it's important because it's the, the conservation of this quantity that will give you some uh, compactness on the sequence afterwards. So you have the kinetic energy, the density of, uh, of energy, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, maybe one very small comment here. I didn't really specify the domain, which is a bad thing. So I'm working with omega in the present case. Uh, I'm working essentially with omega, which is a 3D torus, except I'm cheating a little bit because I really wanted to present you the um, the equation that I wrote down yesterday. And in their paper, uh, <coughs> Feyerheisel and Novotny, when they work with the torus, they don't exactly have this E3 here because it's not so good for the periodicity in the vertical direction, okay? So they need to replace this vector E3 which something, with uh, something that is a collinear to E3 but has mean zero over a period, okay? Uh, well, this is not really important. It uh, slightly changes the, the, the limits, but okay. So let me just uh, not talk about that. So I'm cheating a little bit. Okay. Uh, X3 is uh, Z, right? Yeah, it's Z, exactly. And the capital E there in front of the row is an epsilon. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. 
uh, and the density of energy here. Yeah, sometimes uh, also the epsilon has subscripts and sometimes there are subscripts. And uh, it, if I try to have a uniform notation, I know I will fail. So a subscript and a superscript are the same for me, okay? Uh, and the density of energy looks like this. So it's epsilon, theta, theta epsilon to the power four over rho epsilon plus three halves theta epsilon over this times P of rho epsilon over theta epsilon to the three halves. So uh, you have a theorem by the same authors uh, a few years before in 2005 stating that there exists a global variational solution for this set of equations, but you don't have uniqueness. Okay, it's uh, more or less the same problem as with uh, Lorentz solutions for 3D Navier-Stokes. Okay. Um, but, so the, 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 so the theorem by Feyerheisel and Novotny is that you have a global variational solution of the system, so no uniqueness, uh, yes. And so this is a, this global variational solution is the starting point of the analysis. So you start with a global variational solution with initial data that look like this. So that are a constant say, state, say one one, okay, because everything is uh, non-dimensionalized here. So we can take uh, one everywhere everywhere, uh, plus epsilon variations, okay? So this is your starting point. Okay. Uh, and you want to try and derive some compactness on your sequence to pass to the limit in your set of equations. So this will be easy for part of the solution and not so easy for another part of the solution for which we will need to use Chauchet's method. So maybe I will go over quickly uh, for everything uh, that doesn't concern Chauchet's method. I will just give you hints of uh, why it works. Um, so your initial data is, uh, so let's say rho epsilon at t equals zero is one plus epsilon rho mm -hmm, uh, epsilon zero, something like that. And theta epsilon at t equals zero is one plus epsilon, theta epsilon zero, where rho epsilon zero, theta epsilon zero are compact, for instance. Okay, and uh, what you, the first thing that you do is try and derive a series of bounds on your sequence. So you will have some uniform bounds on the sequence. Obviously what you have is a conservation of mass. Oh yes, and without loss of generality, I will assume that the integral over the domain of rho epsilon zero is zero, okay? So I can always decide to write rho epsilon as one plus epsilon, uh, say rho epsilon one, and theta epsilon equals one plus epsilon theta epsilon one, okay? I can always decide to do that. And conservation of mass tells me that the integral of rho epsilon one um, 
in the torus is equal to zero for all time, okay? Then you also have conservation of energy. And one observation is that if you normalize correctly your, uh, your, uh, the entropy and everything, um, you will have the following property. So if you use conservation of energy and also the fact that the entropy is increasing, plus, uh, yes? Conservation of energy you didn't give us as one of the original equations. Is it an algebraic consequence of the three equations you gave us? Uh, but then only if you set the equal sign over there and not the larger equal, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, no, I don't think so. I think what they are constructing is really something with an inequality, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, so it's not really an algebraic, well, if you, let me state it this way. If you have a smooth family of solutions, then this smooth family of solutions satisfies the, the equations with an equality, okay? And this smooth family of solutions also satisfies the, the energy, uh, the conservation of energy, okay? So the fact that the inequality is not an equality may come from shocks within the equation, okay? And when they construct a family of variational solutions, they construct uh, some solutions that don't have sufficient regularity to prove that the inequality is an equality. And this family of solutions, on the other hand, satisfies a conservation of energy with an equality. An exactly. Exactly. Uh, so we have conservation of energy and the fact that in the uh, Entropy is non-decreasing. And this gives you the following bound. So you have the supremum over all epsilon positive and over time of the integral over the domain of one half rho epsilon two plus one over epsilon three, and this is the important part because it will give you really some strong compactness on the, well, not strong compactness, but it will give you some compactness on the sequences rho and theta, plus rho epsilon, how did I denote it? I can at least try to be consistent from one line to another, uh, times x three, uh, plus, and let me write this to mu epsilon of zero t times omega. This is finite. And here, mu epsilon is precisely your defect measure. So in other words, uh, since this is greater than sigma, I can always write that it's sigma epsilon plus some mu epsilon, where mu epsilon is a positive measure, okay? And the, the using this, the, 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 uh, uh, the bound on the, um, the conservation ener on the energy plus this uh, quantity here gives you some bound on mu epsilon and H epsilon is given by the following formula. So I'm sorry for the technicality, but I, I hope this will be the last quantity I introduce. I think so. Epsilon of rho theta. So it's really a linearization of uh, the, uh, the energy, okay?
minus e epsilon of 1, 1. Okay, so as you can see, so the uh, easy thing to do is to realize that if, uh, let's say, rho minus one is smaller than, say, one half, and theta minus one is also smaller than one half, so if you are in the vicinity of the equilibrium, then h epsilon of rho and theta is greater than some constant times rho minus one square plus theta minus one square, okay? So h epsilon controls, and uh, here the constant c is independent of epsilon, okay? So h epsilon controls the error that you're making, the, uh, the, the discrepancy with respect to equilibrium, okay? So this will essentially what we will be giving you some compactness on uh, the density and on uh, the, temp the temperature. Okay, so I, I won't be proving that, but you, it's really a combination of conservation of energy and of the last equation, okay? So you have a series of consequences. from all of these conservations. So your, the first consequence is that rho epsilon one and theta uh, epsilon one are compact in uh, the following spaces. Uh, so, uh, so maybe I will write down this in a slightly different way. So rho epsilon weakly converges towards some rho one in W star L infinity of a compact uh, interval time times uh, some LP space. U epsilon, so for U epsilon you have the usual bounds, so it weakly converges to U in L2 in time with values H1 in space. And the important thing is that rho epsilon converges towards one strongly, or in other words, uh, no, that's it. Rho epsilon converges to one strongly in uh, L1 and L infinity in some space, okay? Okay, so this means that, for instance, uh, you can pass and you also have some compactness on uh, theta epsilon that I will write down right away, and you have theta epsilon one which weakly converges towards theta one in W L2 H1 and uh, theta epsilon also strict, uh, uh, strongly converges towards one in uh, L2 H1. Okay, so you can pass to the limit in a lot of the equations. So first, in the first equation here, uh, so rho epsilon, you, you, can, you pass to the limit obviously in the sense of distributions. So we have no problem to pass to the limit in dt rho epsilon. And then for the product rho epsilon times u epsilon, one is converging strongly, the other is converging weakly. So you have weak against strong convergence and you can pass to the limit. Okay, you have the, essentially the same thing in the last equation, so think of S epsilon as a theta epsilon, okay, and uh, uh, so it's easy to pass to the limit in the, in the last equation, okay? Once you have divided, uh, you have removed the, the constant set and divided by, uh, by, uh, by theta epsilon, so 
What I want to focus on today, uh, and the actual difficulty, is to pass to the limits in the quadratic term, rho epsilon, u epsilon, u epsilon, okay? Because for that term, u epsilon converges weakly, and rho epsilon uh, is converging strongly, but that's not enough to pass to the limit in uh, the three terms, okay? Because rho epsilon, u epsilon is only converging weakly. Okay, so you have to do something and work with that term to pass to the limit. Okay, so the main issue So let me just uh, first uh, notice that you can pass to the limit. So it's always a weak limit, right? In the uh, first equation of uh, the Navier-Stokes Fourier uh, system, and what you obtain is that divergence of u equals zero. Okay? So the, now the main difficulty is to pass to the limit in uh, the divergence of rho epsilon, u epsilon, with u epsilon, okay? So let me remark on something. If we knew that, for instance, dt u epsilon were bounded, then we would inherit some strong compactness on the sequence u epsilon, and there wouldn't be a problem. So the problem is really coming from the penalization on the gradient of the pressure, okay? And uh, on the stratification in the right-hand side. But this is really the, so it's the nonlinearity and the fact that the time derivative of u epsilon is not bounded because you have waves, okay? So to pass to the limit in that term, you, uh, the first thing that you do is isolate, isolate some part of the um, uh, of uh, u epsilon in which you can actually have some strong compactness and you can pass to the limit. So you introduce uh, the following set. So k is the set of functions in L2. Uh, maybe not you, V of T3, such that divergence of V is zero. And P is the Loret projector. So it's the, the orthogonal projection on K. Okay? And now what I'm going to do is apply uh, the operator P to the second equation. In uh, NSF epsilon, okay? So the equation on the conservation of momentum. Why do I do that? Because if I do that, the gradient of the pressure disappears, okay? Because it's in the kernel of P. And the, okay, and if you write rho epsilon as one plus epsilon rho one, then uh, the, the term that is just one over epsilon also disappears because it's a gradient, okay? So you are only left with a minus the projection of uh, rho uh, epsilon one, which is not so bad. Uh, okay, so now I will go back to this. So if I do that, I notice that the, so P of one over epsilon square gradient of P epsilon, this is exactly zero. And the, ortho, the projection of one over epsilon times uh, rho epsilon E3, this is also equal to the projection of rho epsilon one E3, 
okay? In other words, when I apply this projection, all the singular terms disappear, okay? So what you obtain is that dt of the projection of rho epsilon u epsilon, this is bounded in some uh, negative suballoy space. Okay, the consequence is that P of rho epsilon u epsilon is strongly compact. And obviously, since rho epsilon was also strongly compact, P of u epsilon is also strongly compact. Okay, so I can simplify my problem a little bit when I want to pass to the limit in that quantity here. Okay, when I write the projection of the divergence of rho epsilon, u epsilon, u epsilon. This is the term in which I want to pass to the limit, okay? I can decompose rho epsilon, u epsilon between the projection onto k, which is compact, and the orthogonal projection, which is not compact, but uh, I will try and do something about it later, okay? So this is... Uh, so... Maybe I will write this in a more compact form. Uh, so in that you write rho epsilon u epsilon as its projection plus identity minus the projection. U epsilon, same thing. Okay, now, so you have a product, so you have four terms, right, if you develop everything. In these four terms, each time you have a projection, you have some strong compactness, so there is no problem to pass to the limit. Okay, so the only issue is to pass to the limit in the projection of the divergence of identity minus P of rho epsilon u epsilon cross identity minus P of u epsilon, okay? And this is where Shusha's method comes in handy. So you need to control the non-divergence free part of rho epsilon u epsilon. So you apply this operator, identity minus p, to the second equation, okay? So let me define, uh, I don't think I use capital U epsilon, so this will be identity minus P of rho epsilon U epsilon, okay? Uh, and you, what you have is the following. So you apply identity minus P to uh, the second equation, and what you're going to do is also, you, so you, when you uh, apply to the second equation, so that in that case you keep the gradient of the pressure term, which I will now expand. So I will write one over the gradient of the pressure term 
plus one over epsilon rho epsilon. And this is exactly, or well, I can expand it, so it's one over epsilon, so it's uh, the same computation as the one I did formally uh, earlier today, it's equal to that. S0, uh, S uh, theta epsilon one, plus Z, plus some term of other one, okay? And this I will call one over epsilon, gradient of the epsilon, plus a big O of one, okay? And what happens is, so uh, S0 and M0 are uh, positive constants that are given by the linearization. It's really the same computation as the one I did formally uh, uh, earlier on today. And you're going to look at the system satisfied by U epsilon V epsilon. So the, when you differentiate U epsilon with time, the main order term is the gradient of V epsilon. This is uh, exactly the equation. Okay, so what you have is dt u epsilon plus one over epsilon gradient of v epsilon equals something of order one, and dt v epsilon plus uh, m zero over epsilon divergence of u epsilon equals something of order one. Why? Uh, this this one here comes from the um, the conservation of mass, okay? When you write the conservation of mass, so, and you write rho one as a, rho, uh, you write rho epsilon as one plus epsilon rho one, so dt rho epsilon is epsilon dt rho epsilon one, okay? You divide by epsilon and you get exactly this, okay? Because uh, you, yeah, the divergence of u uh, epsilon is exactly the divergence of rho epsilon u epsilon. Okay, and now, tada, this is exactly a wave system of Shusha's type. Okay, so you apply Shusha's the theory, if you want. Okay, so you look at the wave operator Uh, so did I give it a name? Well, uh, L, which so such that dt u v d tau of u v plus uh, L u v equals zero. So L uh, of u v, this is exactly gradient of v. Uh, M0 zero divergence of U. Okay, and if you compute W epsilon of T, which is exponential minus T over epsilon L, U epsilon V epsilon, now this is compact, okay, for the reasons that I explained earlier. So I'm almost done. I will try not to go too much over my time. So if you remember uh, well what I stated in the beginning, uh, what you need to do is diagonalize L and, um, and, find, uh, and find some possible resonances, okay? So the... Uh, eigenvectors, or at least the solutions of the wave equation are given by exponential plus or minus i square root of m naught modulus of k times tau plus i k x, so it's a Fourier, and k minus 
square root of m0 times k. Okay? And so you compute the quadratic term And in particular, so uh, when you look at the resonance set, so I will uh, go to that directly. Uh, when you look at the resonance set, since the frequencies are essentially modulus of k, the resonance set is, uh, uh, yes, modulus of k. Yeah, because one of the frequencies, you're projecting onto zero frequency modes, okay? So uh, your resonance set will be modulus of k equals modulus of L, okay? Because I'm taking m equals uh, modulus of, uh, I'm taking, uh, yes, m equals zero because I'm projecting onto the non-resonant frequencies, okay? When I want to pass to the limits in that quantity. Here, when I project with p, I'm removing all oscillating sequences, so I'm taking essentially m equals zero. So your resonance set will satisfy m equals zero, and then what you will need to look at is the projection of, I'm going a bit quickly here, so I apologize for that, of i exponential i k plus l times x, okay, uh, k times k plus l, times L. I'm going a bit quickly, but uh, this is really the projection. Okay, your, uh, the first vector is k, so you have a k tensor L oscillating at a frequency uh, k plus L, so I'm taking the divergence, this gives me the k plus L, and then I'm projecting again uh, against, uh, against this. And then if you follow... Times k plus L times x times k. No, 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 sorry. There. Okay. Uh, so I need to compute that quantity. And in fact, I can uh, symmetrize things a bit. Because if the observation is that if modulus of k equals modulus of L, then you have k, k plus L equals uh, L k plus l, right? Okay, you develop, this is k square, uh, k scalar product with l, and here we have l square, which is k square, and l scalar product with k, okay? So if I uh, symmetrize a bit my, uh, my, the expansion that I had earlier on with respect to k and l, I transform this into the projection of exponential i k plus l x, and here, what I have is, uh, so I have k, k plus l, l, uh, plus l, k plus l, l, right? Okay, and now, uh, if I'm grouping everything together, what you, what you see is that, in fact, I obtain a kind of gradient uh, it was this k when I symmetrize, okay? And now I can uh, take, this is equal to this, so I can remove it from the projection, and I obtain exponential i k plus l times the vector k plus l. So this is exactly a gradient, okay? k plus l times exponential i k plus l x is a gradient, and so the projection on two divergence free fields is zero. So, in fact, in that case, the resonance set is empty. Okay? That's the conclusion. So, and set is empty, okay? So you can pass to the limit in uh, that quantity, pass to the weak limit in that quantity because you have no resonance set at all, 
Okay, so you have one term that is compact, one term for which you use Chauchet's method, and in the term for which you use Chauchet's method, uh, there, is, there are no resonances and you can pass to the weak limit and the weak limit is zero. So you can pass to the weak limit in uh, the second equation and the limit gives you exactly the formal limit that I derived earlier on. So uh, I hope this illustrates Chauchet's method even though I went a bit quickly in the end uh, for the computations of this resonance set. And I will stop here and apologize for the five minute uh, delay.